Welcome to today's webcast, Accelerating Urban Informatics with Microsoft Azure. I would like to turn today's event over to Tim Pan. Tim, you now have the floor. Thank you, Stephanie. Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening to other part of the world. Uh, welcome to the Microsoft Azure webinar series. My name is Tim Pan. I'm the University Relations Director for Microsoft Research Asia based in Beijing. Today's topic is accelerating urban informatics with Microsoft Azure, which concerns how to use cloud computing to advance the research on urban problems. Probably most of us are aware of urban problems, especially those living in Beijing and Shanghai, including all the speakers today. In April, the Economist has a special report on the cities that will change the world, which discusses the challenges and opportunities of the faster growing cities in China. It points out that in past 30 years, Chinese urban population has risen 500 million. That's a phenomenon never seen in the human history. And it's not the end. The Chinese city population is still growing. By 2030, 1 billion people, or 70% of Chinese, will be living in cities. So no matter how fast the Chinese government de develops infrastructure, it's never enough. There's always traffic jam and overly crowded public space. Growing urban population also causes other environmental problems such as air and water pollution, noise, and overconsumption of energy. However, in Chinese, we like to say, when there is a crisis, there is opportunity. If we manage urban problems well, like the economist says, we will change the world. For example, by 2020, we expect a high-speed rail connecting all Chinese cities with more than a half million people. That means around one billion people will be connected by a network of high-speed rail. And we have never seen that level of convenience in human history. Along this thought, we hope more urban problems can be solved and more opportunities can be found. So Microsoft Research Asia collaborates with academia, working on various projects The purpose is to accelerate urban informatics research with the power of Microsoft Azure. Starting from last year, we have requested for proposals addressing critical urban challenges and received many in the areas like urban transportation, noise, pollution, energy consumption, smart community or buildings, urban lifestyles, and social happiness. Most of the project use cloud to collect and or analyze the big data of the big cities. We hope a research community can be fostered so the School of Urban Sciences can continue and prosper. With the joint efforts, we hope our cities will be more livable in years to come. In the meantime, Microsoft Research is running a program called Azure for Research which provides free cloud resources to academia. If a professor has a research idea and wants to try cloud computing, he or she can go to the website asiaforresearch.com, submitting a three-page proposal to the RP. Then there is a chance to win a sizable cloud resource for a year. In addition to RP, you can also find a workshop and a training information there. Now, in this webinar, we have invited two distinguished speakers. One is my colleague, Dr. Yu Zheng. He's a leader researcher of Microsoft Research in Asia. The talk he will share with us is Advances of Urban Computing in Microsoft Research Asia. The second speaker is Professor Yan Ming Zhu. He's an associate professor from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. 
He wants to share with us his research project, crowdsourcing-based urban noise mapping with smartphones. This project is a winner of both Urban Informatics RFP and Azure for Research RFP. Now let's welcome the first speaker, Dr. Yu Zheng. Yi, you have the mic. Thank you for the introduction. Okay. So uh, I'm Yu from Microsoft Research Azure, uh, working on urban computing. As we know, the rapid progress of urbanization has modernized many people's lives, but also generated a lot of problems, such as traffic congestion, energy consumption, and environmental pollution. Tackling these challenges years ago seems nearly impossible, given the complex setting of the city. But recently, the advances in sensing technology and large-scale uh, large inf computing infrastructure has generated a variety of big data, from social media to traffic floor, from geographic data to meteorology data. So if used correctly, the data can help us tackle these challenges we are facing in cities. Motivated by this opportunity, we came up with a vision on urban computing, which connects urban sensing, urban data management, urban data analytics, and service providing into a loop for continuous and unobtrusive improvement on people's life, city operating system, and environment. In short, we're going to tackle the big challenge in big city by using big data. So in the following slides, I will show you what kind of big data we are using in urban computing. The first one is a road network data. So this map shows Beijing, Beijing's road network. Well, the red line stands for the highway connecting Beijing to other cities. The blue circle means the ring road of Beijing. Having the data of consecutive years, we can sense how the city is expanding. The second data is point of interest data. So each point of interest has a name, address, P, uh, category, and location information. So for example, this map shows the distribution of movie theater and parks in Beijing, where a yellow point stands for a movie theater, and blue point means a park. As we can see, the tons of park in Beijing, which means Beijing is already a fun city. So having the data of consecutive years, we can sense how the business of the city was growing or is changing over years. For instance, the number of movie theaters keeps on increasing in past five years, uh, reaching 260 within the urban area. So this could imply more and more people would like to watch a movie in a movie theater instead of buying DVD. Air quality data, uh, which usually classify into some category like good, moderate, and healthy, is very related to people's hairs. <clears throat> And this data is also very related to meteorological data, such as weather, humidity, temperature, etc. Uh, Check-in data is not the kind of human mobility data in the city, as we know well, people have been to a place. So okay. this figure shows the check-in data in Manhattan on two categories. Uh, one is entertainment, another is that. Uh, nightlife sports. So this is a city-wide human mobility data. Last but not least is a GPS trajectory data set generated by over 30,000 taxi cabs uh, in Beijing. This is a visualization of uh, three months data. Well, the lighter, the denser. The data tells us not only the traffic pattern on road surface, but also the city-wide human mobility pattern because we know where people get on a taxi and then get off a taxi. Using these data sets, we have been enabled a series of technical work from finding the practically fastest paths based on large-scale taxi cab trajectories to delineate the programmatic design in a city's road network and to identify the functional region in a city. Last year, we have three new results about 
large-scale dynamic ride sharing among taxi cabs, and air quality, and real-time gas consumption sensing in a city. So I will give you three examples in my following presentation. The first one is about air quality. Air pollution is not a global concern, especially in developing countries like China. Many cities have built underground air quality monitoring stations to inform their citizens air, urban air quality every hour. However, the number of air quality monitoring stations are quite limited because building such kind of station is very expensive in terms of money, land use, and human resource. Unfortunately, air quality varies by location significantly and is highly skewed in city. For example, this is a map of Beijing. Each icon stands for one air quality monitoring station. The number associated with each icon means air quality index. The smaller, the better, the bigger, the worse. Green means very good and red means unhealthy. As we can see, even at the same moment, the air quality reading from these stations could be very different, even if some of the stations are very close to each other. It's not surprising to see this phenomenon, as air quality is influenced by multiple complex factors, such as traffic floor, uh, land use, density of structure or buildings, and fine grain meteorology, uh, meteorology. Now, this factor could be very different in different places of city. Now, the problem is we don't really know the air quality of a location without a monitoration station. So, for example, what's the air quality of our, of our current location? So, it's not an average number of the station of the reading from the existing stations. So, what do we do here? We infer real-time and fine green air quality information throughout the entire city using two parts of big data. The first one is a real-time and historic air quality data from existing stations. The second part are five additional data sources we observe in the city. Uh, the first one it could be uh, meteorology data, such as uh, windy, uh, sunny, or temperature, humidity, etc. Uh, traffic data. Uh, Human mobility data, that is the number of people move into a location or leaving a location in a given time slot. Or point of interest data, such as um, how many parks, the number of restaurants, shopping malls, and factories in a region. And the structure of real network, such as the number of intersections, traffic lights, and length of highways. Using data mining and the machine learning algorithm, we can build a network between the data we observed in a location and the air quality of the location. So in the future, given the data of the location, we can infer its air quality. So this is the orange data we have, and this is what we can infer. So having such kind of fan green air quality data, um, we can inform people's decision making. For example, uh, when and where go jogging, uh, when to close a window. It could be very different from um, the average number of the whole city. And also this is a step towards identifying towards identify the root cause of air pollution. Before we identify the root cause, root cause of air pollution, we need to know where it's always polluted. So this system is built up based on the framework that connects cloud with client, where clouds continues connecting data to collect data and process data and to serve users with real-time service. And the user can access real-time information by using either a mobile client or a web service. So you can search for Urban Air in Microsoft uh, App Store or access the website through the URL. It's publicly available. So we have evaluated our service uh, with the data from 10 cities. Uh, to evaluate the accuracy of our result, we intentionally remove one station from existing map. And we can infer the air quality of the location using our algorithm. Then we can measure the accuracy of the prediction using the reading from the former station as a ground truth. 
So we do such kind of evaluation for each station in each hour and see how statistically accurate our algorithm is in past one year. As a result, our algorithm is about 80% accurate uh, in Beijing, which is much higher than existing uh, measure using by, used by environmentalists, so which is only about 60%. So that means the big data has bring 20% jump on accuracy beyond the state of the art. So that's a value of big data. You can refer to my paper uh, published at the KDD last year for details of the research. The next example is about identifying the functional region of city using two parts of data, uh, human mobility and the point of interest data. So this is the results we're presenting you uh, here. Uh, it's a real result of Beijing. Um, so red region means educational and science area of Beijing, and black area means the once commercial area. But I want to emphasize that the function of region is not single. It has a the region has a multiple functions. So the region sharing the similar color really have the similar distribution across different functions. On the other hand, even the region was recognized as an educational area. It does not mean every part of the region uh, is serving educational functions. So we need to further identify the kernel density distribution of each kind of functional region. So this figure shows the kernel density function of commercial area in Beijing. Where well, the darker color is, the high probability this location could be commercial area. So for each kind of function region, we can build such kind of kernel density distribution. So why need why do we need use two parts of data, two parts of the data? Uh, it's very intuitive to use point of interest data because if we see there are a lot of university in a region, this region could be educational area, but only using point of interest data is not enough because data is static in the database. Let's take a look at example showing the figure up in the bottom of the slides. There are two restaurants, uh, both recorded as a Chinese restaurant in the POI database. But clearly they have different meanings. One could be built in neighborhood serving local pe serving local people, but another one could be built in commercial area or tourist attractions. So Using human mobility data, we can differentiate between the POIs of the same category. And also, point of entry data can differentiate the functional region itself. Let's take a look at, at this example. If we say the majority of people leaving a location in the morning and then coming back in the location, uh, to the location in the evening, then most likely this region could be a residential area. So that's the reason why I need to combine two parts of data. Um, how we evaluate our service? Um, we can compare the results generated by our method in two consecutive years uh, and see whether the change makes sense. Okay, here we can see Region A was recognized as an emerging area in in Beijing, uh, which is indicated by yellow, but becomes but became green, which means under construction area uh, in 2011. Um, after a study, we found this is uh, the tallest building of Beijing is truly under construction in this area. So this region is truly under construction. That means our algorithm accurately uh, acquired this uh, change in the city. So another example is region B, which was recognized as a green area, which, which means uh, park, nature and park, but later, but later become a black area, which means commercial area. So this is actually the Chenmen Street. Uh, around the Olympic game, this tree has been rebuilt with hundreds of shops and stores located here. Now it's truly a commercial area. And then we also compare our result against the land use of Beijing. Uh, this is a Wanjing area which was planned for residential area. And in our results, the majority of place uh, was identified as an emerging residential area, which is correct. Uh, we also found some proper area, which means 
emerging commercial area. This is not bad, but we need to let our city planner know so they can have a better planning for the future. In the third example, <clears throat> we are going to study the real-time gas consumption in a city. So let me ask you one question. Um, who can tell me how many liters of gas has been consumed in past one hour in Beijing? I think nobody can answer this question, and we don't even have this data available. Um, so how we achieve that? Okay, we use GPS equipped test cap as a sensor to infer or to detect their queuing time in a gas station. That means that the time they spend for refueling their cars. Okay. And then based on the waiting time, we can infer the length of queue. Then we know how many vehicles are there being refueled. Assume each each vehicle um, has been fueled 40, 40 liter gas, then we can infer the gas consumption of the entire gas station. So if we can do such kind of calculation for each station, so we can grasp, grasp the gas consumption of the entire city in the past one hour. So what is research for? Um, very simple application scenario is gas station recommendation based on uh, in terms of waiting time. So usually we are not we we are looking for some gas station with the shortest queue, but the closest gas station is not not really the quickest one. So I prefer travel 100 further than find a better one. But the more what what's more important is our research can improve energy infrastructure of a city. For example, if we see an area where we always find a lot of people refueling their car and the people have to wait for a very long period of time. So probably we need to consider uh, build additional stations around this, state, uh, this area. On the other side, uh, if we find some region where gas stations have been overbuilt, probably we can shut down some stations temporarily or reduce the staff working there. And we can also tell government uh, the number of people uh, who are refueling their car in gas station at any hour. For example, in the morning rush hour, there are about 60,000 people are there in gas station in Beijing. And the average waiting time is about 30 minutes in workday. But when time goes to 8 p.m. in the evening, the average waiting time is about 6 minutes. So I usually choose this time to refuel my car. Um, this figure shows the results we have. Um, well, I want to emphasize we are not infer the gas consumption, gas consumption of test caps. We are using gas test cap as a sensor to infer the gas consumption, uh, gas consumption of all the vehicles in the city. So if we can compare the heat map of the two results. Um, figure B shows the time spent by test caps, and figure D shows the time spent by all vehicles. You can see the difference. And figure C shows the heat map in terms of taxes with it. And figure E shows the urban with it, that means all vehicles with it. There are some regions we found there are not of test cap, for example, in region A. But in terms of the total number of vehicles here, it's not, it's not, not, not many. So that's the value of our research. So let me summarize uh, what's urban computing, uh, some takeaway message. Our vision is 3B, that means using big data to tackle big cities, big challenge. Our methodology is 3M, that is data management, data mining, and machine learning. And our results is a win-win-win situation among people, city, and environment. So in an even shorter code, is three BMW. That's urban computing. Thank you for your attention. Now, for more information, you can search for urban computing on, on, on the internet, and you can get slide deck and paper, even the data about the research. Uh, thank you for your attention. Now I'm handing the talk to Professor Zhu from Jiao Tong University. Thank you, Zheng Yu. This is Yamin Zhu. Uh, in the Department of Computer Science and uh, Engineering at Shanghai Dalton University. I am in Shanghai, China. So let me try change the slide. 
So that is a big one. Uh, so my project is about uh, crowdsourcing based urban noise mapping with smartphones. Uh, this is outline of my talk. First of all, I will talk about the motivation of the uh, project. Second, I will uh, talk about the design of our system, uh, which we call it uh, Noise Sense. Uh, next, I will discuss uh, how we implement uh, with the service from Microsoft Asia. And uh, finally, I conclude my talk. Our project is about noise. Uh, so by definition, noise is the excessive sound that may harm the activity or balance of human life. And in daily life, noise pollution is everywhere. So the noise can be caused by uh, traffic on the road or caused by machines uh, in construction or caused by uh, loud music on streets. And a long-term exposure to noise pollution may lead to uh, emotional to physiological and uh, psychological effects. Uh, there are qu there are actually many uh, harmful effects. For example, uh, related related diseases include hearing impairment, hypertension, ischemical heart disease, and etc. And longer effects may result in changes to immune system and birth defects. So it is really important for the public to know what is the noise level and try to avoid long-term exposure to noise pollution. The question is, uh, how people know uh, what is the noise level at a given location uh, in some certain time slots? But unfortunately, it is really limited. Uh, there are limited ways uh, for the general public to know uh, what is the noise level at a given time, a given location. So one available way is to actually install measurement stations and the people can read the noise level uh, from the display. Uh, this method has limited coverage and the general public uh, is difficult uh, to, to read to access the noise data. So a key step toward uh, reducing the impact of noise pollution is to develop a noise mapping service. So this picture on the right uh, gave one example. So what is the noise mapping service? So essentially, we add one overlay on the map. So the, this overlay gives the, the, the information, uh, the noise level at a given location, at the present, or at a time in the past. So by using this noise mapping service, uh, one is able to query the noise level at a time uh, and at any uh, location uh, this user may be interested in. So the goal of the project is to build a cloud setting based uh, system for large scale fine grained urban noise mapping. Uh, I would like to emphasize uh, this project is still ongoing and not finished yet. So the significance of this project is three so first of all, uh, by using uh, this uh, noise mapping service, the general public is able to uh, assess uh, the exposure to noise pollution and plot uh, measures can be taken to avoid long-term exposure. And second, the authority or local government can better understand the situation of noise pollution uh, of a given city and may reinforce, uh, for example, laws when it is necessary. And finally, urban planners can take the noise pollution into consideration when they are planning urban areas. So next, I will talk about the design of our system, uh, noise sense. Basically, uh, the system tries to leverage uh, the technique, we call it uh, cloud sourcing, uh, which is a very popular uh, approach now uh, to try to uh, make use of the power of the cloud. So the main idea of our system is the following. So by each, uh, each smartphone can measure the noise level at a given location uh, with its embedded microphone. So by recruiting a large number of individual smartphones uh, 
exactly the mean of uh, crowdsourcing. Uh, it is possible to collect a large uh, data set of noise data in an urban area. And uh, by collecting and processing the noise data uh, from smartphones, we can provide the noise mapping service uh, to a given uh, urban area. Then the general public can uh, look at the service and uh, get the idea what is the noise level of one particular location at a uh, time point, at uh, a given time uh, slot, for example. So our system architecture is shown in this picture. We are we are using uh, the service from Microsoft Azure. So uh, basically, on the bottom, we have a large number of smartphones, and each smartphone will measure the data, the noise data, and share the data with the cloud. So on the cloud side, we, we make use of several uh, services from Microsoft Azure. We use uh, Azure storage to store the data from the, from the phones. And we use uh, computing resources, for example, virtual machines to process the data. And also we use a cloud service to, 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 to get the data from the smartphones. And also we use uh, Azure web website service to provide the noise mapping service. Then uh, users, for example, desktop clients, can use their browsers to access, to, uh, to access the noise mapping service. Smartphone users can use smartphone app to access uh, the noise mapping service. In building such a system, there are several challenges. So first, we have to uh, accommodate a large number of uh, sensing terminals. So in our case, that is uh, smartphones. And the number of users uh, can be large. So again, we have to accommodate a large number of users and their requests. So second, uh, smartphones are not designed for noise measurements. And a measurement made by a smartphone may contain error. So in this case, we have to do uh, calibration. And finally, smartphone users are reluctant to perform sensing uh, tasks to collect noise data uh, for us. So we have to, to provide uh, incentive to the smartphone users. First of all, I talk about how we do calibration. Okay. So in this slide, I first show uh, errors can be very large. So as you can see on the left pic picture, uh, we show the measurements uh, made by a smartphone and also the true value, which is from a noise level meter, which is a professional uh, meter. So as you can see, there is a big gap between the two curves and the error can be as large as 15 dBA. Okay. Uh, on the right, uh, this curve is a uh, empirical CDF of the errors. So as you can see, uh, around 40% of the errors is larger than 15 dBA. So that is a real uh, big problem. Our approach for calibration uh, is motivated by one observation. So we plot the scat uh, plot of the data from the smartphones and also the measurement from the professional meter so x-axis is smartphone measurements, y-axis is the true value. So as you can see, uh, there is uh, a clear linear relationship between the two values. So we can use, uh, for example, regression techniques to derive the slope of the line. And also we need to derive the offset in order to uh, calibrate the measurements from the smartphones. Based on this observation, we design, uh, we design one intervention free calibration. So here I emphasize that, uh, it is intervention free. That means smartphone users don't need to put any, uh, input in order to do this uh, calibration. So this approach, uh, consists of two components. One is node based calibration and the second cross sourcing, uh, based calibration. So first we introduce uh, node basic calibration. So this is uh, uh, actually simple. So by using this uh, node based calibration, each node
can automatically uh, find what is uh, what is the offset for this smartphone. So the idea is to find a common quiet base. So based on this base, we can compute the offset. Okay. So after having this offset, we can calibrate all the measurements by this by this smartphone, and the output is correct. It's close to the true value. But the major uh, problem with this node-based calibration is that uh, it takes time. Okay, the, the the latency can be large. So in order to address this issue, we propose another another uh, component, which is cloud sourcing-based calibration. So idea of this component is actually simple. Uh, different forms, different forms of the same model, they share similar offsets. Okay, so after a form already uh, get the offset, this offset can be shared uh, through a cloud, for example. So the idea is we build a table or a mapping. What is the offset for a given uh, for a given smartphone model? Then a new smartphone uh, without calibration. It can look up uh, what is the offset for this model and then get the offset for this, uh, for this smartphone. So by doing so, this calibration latency can be significantly reduced. So next, uh, we talk about uh, how we provide incentive. In general, uh, smartphone users are reluctant to provide uh, sensing data to, to the system. So the main reasons are the, the following. Uh, first, uh, sensing noise data consumes uh, resources, for example, uh, computing resources and energy. And second, by providing resources, uh, there is a risk of privacy breach. So uh, it is really important to provide uh, enough incentive to the smartphone users in order to get a large number of a large number of smartphone users to, to share their uh, noise measurements. So our idea is to provide a, a incentive through, uh, for example, money or points. And um, we build a, a, a system uh, which is based on a reverse auction model. So we use the idea of auction. So first of all, the platform will uh, announce what is uh, what is the available sensing task? And the smartphones can compete for these uh, tasks by providing uh, a bid uh, to the platform. And the platform will determine uh, which are winning uh, smartphones. Okay. Next, smartphones will uh, collect the noise data and share the data with the platform. And eventually, the platform will uh, pay the money. And based on this uh, framework, we propose a choose for auction mechanism. So in essence, this mechanism consists of two algorithms. One is task allocation algorithm to determine which are uh, winning uh, smartphones, and they will provide the data. And the second algorithm is a novel payment scheme. Okay. So I'm not going to uh, talk about the details of this uh, algorithm design. Uh, if you are interested, you can refer to my papers. So one paper is in IEEE Infocon this year, and another one is in IEEE ICDCS again this year. Next, I will talk about how we implement uh, this system with the help of Windows Asia. So this paper shows the general framework of data flow and processing. So on the left, we have the raw data uh, from the smartphones. And on the cloud side, we, we, we build a data receiver component to receive all the raw data. But the raw data may contain errors. So we need a filter to filter all the errors. And eventually, this data will store in the cloud uh, storage. And this data will be processed in order to, to uh, derive a given, a given uh, noise level for a given location and for a given time slot. And the web service uh, will display uh, or, or, or give this uh, noise label at a given location at uh, a given time slot to the end users. So this is what we, we say a noise mapping service. 
building on building on uh, Windows Asia, we actually use several uh, services of Windows Asia. First of all, we use uh, cloud service for data receiver. And second part, we use a virtual machine to, to build, to deploy our data processing algorithms. And also, also we use uh, cloud storage uh, from the Azure to store the raw data. And also we use circle server uh, service, service from, from Windows Azure to store the data to show on the web, on the website. And, and, and also we use the web site service of the Windows Azure to show the noise mapping service. And we build smartphone apps. So using the smartphone app, uh, a user can share the data with the cloud. And also the user is able to uh, access the noise mapping service. So as you can see uh, in this slide, there are four pictures. So picture one show uh, what is the noise level at the current location of this user. And the second page show the noise mapping service. So basically, there's a map. And on top of the map, we, we add an overlay to show the noise label at different locations at present. And it is also uh, able to show the noise label at times of the past. And picture three show uh, uh, how many points you earned. And the last picture show uh, how many uh, sensing tasks you can compete for. In this slide, we show uh, how Windows, Windows, uh, Microsoft Azure can help in noise data collection for lo from a large number of smartphones. So the major challenge here is the number of smartphones contributing data to the cloud can be very large. So the data receiver should be scalable, should be scalable. So the solution uh, we are using is we make use of uh, cloud service, which is shrink shrinkable uh, to the number of smartphones. When the number of smartphones is large, the cloud service will create more instances to address uh, this uh, large number of smartphones. And the number of smartphones uh, becomes smaller. Uh, the number of instances uh, decrease. So it is uh, uh, scalable. And the data from the smartphones will be stored in the cloud storage from the Azure. It is, it is called a blob, so which is a very convenient to use to store it, to store the, to store the data. And in this slide, we uh, discuss how the data is stored in, in the cloud. So basically there are two kinds of, two kinds of data we should store. Uh, on the cloud. One data is raw data from the smartphones. So we store this kind of data in uh, cloud storage using, uh, using the concept blob. And the second type of data is to show on the noise mapping service. So this is more frequently shown or accessed by, by the users. So this data will be stored in Circle Server. Uh, again, this is a service from uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, in this slide, we show how we build the web, the website and uh, the web pages for showing this uh, noise mapping service. So on the cloud side, we make use of the web, the website service uh, on the Microsoft Azure. So again, the, the major challenge is uh, this service or this website should be scalable to the number of uh, users. So when the number of users is very large, the web, the web server should create more instances to address or uh, to accommodate so large number of users. And, and for example, uh, at night, the number of users becomes smaller. We can use smaller instances, uh, on the website. And on the client side, uh, we develop web pages, uh, uh based on the uh, API of Beam Maps. Okay. So that is how we can show an overlay on top of the electronic online maps. And also we develop JavaScript uh, to, show, uh, to show the noise level at a given location, okay? That really concludes uh, my talk.
But in conclusion, we leverage the power of cloud setting, uh, sensing with smartphones to build a noise mapping service. And by uh, this service, uh, the general public can query the noise level at any location at any time. And Windows Asia uh, really facilitate large scale urban computing by providing cloud, ser cloud services, websites, virtual machines, and storage. And I have to acknowledge that many Asia features and services are yet to explore in this project. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for attending. Were there any additional, do any of the presenters have any uh, closing remarks? Uh, okay, uh, I think we have uh, another uh, 12 minutes uh, okay. for Q&A. So uh, if you have any question, you can type into the uh, dialog box. And th th here is a question for um, Professor Chu. Yes, uh, the, please. The question is about the uh, noise mapping service. Uh, apparently, mm -hmm. it uh, looks like a mobile uh, app that mobile people can access and uh, mm -hmm. uh, to 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 know the, uh, the 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 noise mapping of uh, maybe Shanghai. Is that is that right? Yes. Okay. Sure. And the uh, question is, is, is that online yet? Um, because this project is still ongoing and. It is not available to the general public yet. But, uh, for example, after half a year, I hope this service is available to anybody in the world. OK. And uh, then uh, a follow-up question is the, it, how to use the noise map? Because uh, we can see that uh, the, the noise map shows the current noise condition. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. it, but, but how do you use that result, I mean, in our day-to-day? -day? Uh, like. Oh, as a as a, norm, a regular user, uh, there are several ways to access our service. So one simple way is to look at what is the noise level at a given area at present. Okay, but if you are interested in the noise level, for example, in the past uh, uh, three days or one month, you can use uh, the history uh, data exploration. Exploration. Okay. So basically, on on our website. There are several, uh, there are several, uh, menus you can choose. So by, for example, by collecting, uh, the most, uh, noises, places, 10, uh, noise, noisy places in the, in the campus, then the web page will show the locations. Okay. Thank Do you. Do I answer much. the question? Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. And, uh, there is another question for uh, Dr. Zheng. Uh, the question is like this. Uh, you have highlighted uh, 3B, uh, big challenges in big cities with big data. However, in the era of big data, it's always a challenge to find data. Could you share experience with us about how to find big and useful data for research? So, so thank you for the question. Um, our data uh, actually comes from three parts. Uh, first one is uh, Microsoft has its own data sets, like point of interest data and uh, real network data. So we have beam map service. The second part of data uh, comes from public portals of government website, such as New York City has uh, opened their data source for doing research, and there are other cities, even in China, that share some data source. Uh, we can also collaborate. The third part is we can collect some data through collaboration, collaboration with academia and governments. Uh, for for example, we are collaborating with MEP, as is Chinese uh, Environmental Protection uh, Ministry. So they share us with uh, air quality data of different cities to enable our student research. So that's the experience that we collect data. Uh, we collect data. Um, in this big data era, but it is true, it's not easy to get data, and it's always the most important thing to collect data first. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, um, now there's another uh, question for um, Professor Chu. This yes, question please. is uh, is like this: uh, 
you will you you use crowd sourcing to collect yes. the notes. And uh, mm -hmm. how how do you ensure uh, their privacy issue because you are collecting information from their mobile phone? Yeah, this is a very uh, good and a very important question. So privacy is actually a, a very important, a very uh, important uh, issue here. And I think it is um, um, it is true for many similar projects. Okay, so you collect data from smartphones. So in our case, uh, each smartphone will uh, share its noise measurements along with its location and a device ID, right? So in this case, location is a concern. Location privacy is a concern. So in order to uh, ensure uh, privacy of users of smartphones does not uh, uh, does not leak, right? So we we must use uh, techniques to protect this privacy. But I have to say, uh, privacy uh, is still a very important, uh, it's still a very hot topic, research topic, and then many people still uh, doing uh, different techniques to, pro to, pro to, to protect the privacy. So go back to our project, uh, we can use uh, several uh, techniques. For example, we can use encryption to make sure the data trans communication between smartphone and the cloud, cloud can, uh, is safe uh, and uh, is, is secure. That means no other people can read the data from the smartphone. So that is one. And the second, in order to make sure uh, the location privacy uh, is is ensured, we can use, for example, add a noise to the location. Okay, so no accurate location of the user is released. And also, we can use, for example, anonymization uh, to make sure that the ID is protected. Okay, so that is a few uh, potential solutions, but they are. This is a very important research uh, question. Okay, so many uh, research efforts uh, should be made. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. There's another question coming for you. Uh, it's a mm -hmm. short question, maybe asking for a short answer. Does the data storage layer use Hadoop? Uh, it's a question for me. Yes, I think so. Uh, okay. Does the data so, storage uh, our, here in, use Hadoop? Yeah, in our case, in our case, um, we don't use Hadoop yet because uh, pres uh, at present, the processing applied to this data still uh, quite simple. So we simply store the data and periodically uh, process the data uh, and store the result in the SQL server, but. Uh, Hadoop is certainly very useful when we uh, apply more processing uh, uh, requirements. Yeah, that that is my, my answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. There's another one for you. Uh, mm -hmm, please. Okay, I'll just, uh, I'll just uh, read the question, okay? Mm -hmm. the, uh, he asked why raw data is sent from phone to the data processor server. Doesn't it cause a lot of data traffic uh, for users? Oh, uh, uh, why isn't the process on the phone? Yeah, maybe that is uh, inaccurate wording. Uh, wording. So actually, in our in our project, uh, we don't send raw data. Actually, we send a uh, noise level measured by this smartphone. So the data data traffic is actually very very low. Okay, so don't worry about this. Thank you for this uh, for this question. Okay. All right, and uh, there is a uh, question coming for Dr. Zheng. It says, uh, will you release your full data of your urban air relevant paper published in KDD 2013 on your website? Okay, so we have already released the air quality data uh, of Beijing and Shanghai, the two cities, in past one year. But regarding other data sets, such as point of interest data and real network data, it's very sensitive. But we are considering uh, released features, features extracted from the two data sets. So hopefully we could put the features on our website. But that's enough for, for your research. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK, I think there's a question for uh, both. I, I will I will ask Professor Zhu first. 
Yes, uh, please. I, I don't. I don't know if you have the experience with the uh, EC2 from uh, Amazon. But the question is, can you compare Azure with EC2 from Amazon? Do we have any experience okay. with Amazon? Stuff? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. But unfortunately, I've never been. I, I've never used the EC2 yet. Okay. So okay. maybe in future I can. I can compare. That. <laughs> me neither. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we will just uh, skip this uh, question. Okay. And uh, I. I. Uh, because of time, uh, I have one last question, and then we will wrap up. We, we hope to close at uh, 5 o'clock sharp. Uh, I have a question for um, Dr. Zheng. Uh, we, know, we know that uh, in your air quality uh, project, you can um, measure the places where uh, actually there is no uh, quality, uh, air quality meters, right? So my question is, is it possible to forecast uh, the air quality, like, well, ideally, for example, like uh, forecasting the weather, you know that yep. maybe tomorrow <laughs> that there will be PM 2.5 to be how many? Yes, thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, elaborate on our project. So we are actually working on uh, air quality forecasting. That means we can predict the air quality in future hours, such as what's air quality six hours later or six hours or 12 hours later. Um, the, Prediction accuracy is not bad right now. We can, we are, we are very promising to have this service available in in by the end of this year. That's very promising. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be very excited if we can know uh, what the PM 2.5 to be uh, for next next week. Okay. Oh no, that's will be, be exciting. That will be very difficult. We yeah, are we are predicting difficult. a very short future. Okay, short distance talk of future. One again. hour, two hours. No, twelve hours. Twelve hours. Yeah, hour is yeah twelve hour is possible. Yeah. Yeah, that would be very exciting. Okay, uh, because of time, we have to stop here. But before uh, we close, I want to make a little bit of advertisement. So again, please go to uh, azure4research.com. Azure 4. The 4 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 4. Azure4research.com. You can find a lot of uh, more information there. And uh, our upcoming deadline for the Azure for Research RP is, in, is on June 15th. So please, you can um, go to the uh, Azure for Research and look at into this program and submit your proposal. You may be able to win a sizable uh, Azure resource for your research. And uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Zhu and Dr. Zheng for a wonderful presentation today. And uh, they, they uh, wonderfully uh, presented the possibility to use cloud to solve city problems. It's a new and exciting area that we hope to attract more researchers to work on this. And I hope this webinar brings value to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we hope that you found today's information helpful. If you enjoyed today's webcast or have feedback on how we can provide you with a better event, please let us know by completing our survey. You should see the link to the survey in a pop-up box on your screen. As a reminder, all materials from today's presentation will be available on the archive page within 48 hours. You'll be receiving an email. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters. This concludes today's webcast. You may now disconnect from this call.